we are on our way to our first bunch sprint. It's a case of you know, making your move at the right time, anticipating when the gap's going to open and getting through before it closes. It's hectic, it's chaotic, it's fast, it's furious. Down on the right hand side, it's Milan through the centre. There's Groves on the left hand side. Decker's hitting the front as well, but Milan's keeping it. Milan's going all the way, and Jonathan Milan is the winner of stage two for Bahrain victorious. He hit the front and they couldn't budge him. Stage two of the Giro d'Italia gave the sprinters their first opportunity of the race and once for the majority of the stage, it followed the pattern we expected. This is the Giro, so there was, of course, a twist at the end. Well, from the chaos of the crash emerged the unabashed joy of Jonathan Milan's first World Tour and first Grand Tour stage win. Didn't he relish that moment? Slightly less happy with those sprinters denied their chance to take him on. And from a GC point of view, Teo Gagan Hart, who lost 19 seconds and four places in a top 10, still headed by Remco Afinopol. Well, the breakaway's top three are alongside me once again. Dan Lloyd, Robbie McEwen and Adam Blythe all made it through a dramatic finale, relatively unscathed. And we are ready to go for stage three. Two hundred and thirteen kilometers today with a little kick in the tail on the road from Vasto to Melfi. Only fourteen hundred meters of climbing, but most of that comes in the final forty kilometers. It might be another day for the sprint teams, but they are going to have to work hard to earn that chance. Well, after the calm efficiency of Avonpool's win on stage one, how lovely was it to see Jonathan Milan living his dream yesterday, Adam? Mega. Absolutely <laughs> mega. He's a lovely, lovely bloke. I had the pleasure of interviewing him in Tour of Oman, mm. and he's just a lovely person to be around. He's the first Italian since 1999 to win their first road stage in their first Grand Tour as well. I got that stat from Killian Murphy, so thank you. Killian <laughs> Murphy? Um, Killian, oh yeah, Killian Kelly, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not, the Killian, actor, not the actor. If Killian Murphy's watching. <laughs> I mean, and... Killian, if you're watching, great. Murphy, obviously not. Yeah. Um, but it was just brilliant to see and I think you could all see with the emotion and passion from him yesterday. That's what, mm -hmm. as you alluded to yesterday, it's great to see something that means so much to him. You get used to seeing all the top guys always winning and it becomes less and less passionate every mm -hmm. time they do. When we watch, no offence to Teo, but when we watch Teo win the Tory Alps, he was very calm about it. He was just like, yeah, it's great to get a win. But you see someone like Molan winning yesterday and you get happy watching it, you're like, yes, this is brilliant. This is even more better than just a normal person it, winning or whoever it, it might be. It didn't feel like just ticking a box. Yeah. Though, no. did it? Yes, even though it kind of was. But, yeah, I'd love to see that emotion after the finish line from him. Even David Decker of Arkeo Samsic, who finished second, normally a sprinter is not very pleased to finish second, but he was over the moon with that position on the opening road stage yesterday. So, nice to see. Yeah, I love to see that. And it reminds us as well, Robbie, just how much this race matters and how much those stage wins matter because we can become a little bit blasé ourselves as well with every stage win that's ticked off. But this is huge in a rider's career, especially at the stage of his career that he's at, Jonathan Milan. He'll barely have slept last night, Yeah, they? That's, that's right. Some of the big stars can get a bit desensitised mm. to winning big races, but you only get one go at winning your first Grand Tour stage. So it's really exciting. And, and anybody in Jonathan Milan's position would, you know, be just jumping for joy. And, and you may look back at it in years to come and go, oh, I went a bit over the top with that one, but it's acceptable. It, it's so good to see. Oh, it's beautiful. And it came at the end of a couple of kilometres of chaos. Um, before we look at the crash that led into the sprint finale, we would like to take a moment to apologise for getting something wrong yesterday. In the immediate aftermath of looking through the footage, and we wrongly said that Pascal Ackerman was to blame for the crash. He wasn't, of course. He had nothing to do with it. We've issued apologies, and we understand Team UAE Emirates are completely fine with everything that was said. However, we will go back and review the crash now without apportioning blame, because, as I said yesterday... We do sit at a respectful distance, and it's important to do that for that very reason as well. We're looking at how the crash came about. That's not to say that we're blaming anybody necessarily. Robbie, No, we just want to point crash. to what happened. And at first look yesterday, what we saw from the head on, we could see Pascal Ack and we thought, well, he's around about there. And we did jump to a conclusion. Sorry, Pascal, we do apologise. Um, we'll, we'll all move on from it. But mm -hmm. you know, when we got another look and, and got a, an overhead, a slow-mo, a zoom in, then we could then identify actually what did happen. And uh, Caden Groves was following his lead-out train on the left-hand side. And next to him, and sort of 
crowding into his space was uh, David, uh, David Ballerini mm -hmm. from the Quickstep team protecting Remco Evenepoel. He was getting in Grove's space, so he just gave him a bit of an elbow on the hip to move him aside. Uh, Can you show us where we're looking here, Robbie? Yeah, it's... You, well, you got to, it's really hard to mm. see until we can really zoom in. I mean, that's the crash moment itself. But it's in about seventh position, and Ballerini is second of the quick step, the Sudal quick step riders. And it's, it's really difficult to see unless mm. you can really zoom in on it. But you know, after inspecting it on a, you know, a number of occasions, you just see the little elbow against the hip of Ballerini from Groves. That moves him out to the right, sets off a chain reaction through the bunch. Like that wave seems to just get bigger and bigger as it moves its way down, and riders react to others moving across in front of them. The moment where the actual crash happened was uh, unfortunately for him, Martin Tusfeld from DSM was looking to find the whereabouts mm -hmm. of a teammate. He looked over his right shoulder. As he did that, the wave was coming from the left in front of him. He looked back, it was all too late. He made contact with the rider next to him and they went down. It happened some 12 or 15 positions away from where it was initiated with a tiny little elbow. Well, now, come on, it wasn't a tiny elbow. We saw the head-on shot. That's not a mover. I think a tiny <laughs> elbow would be an indication of, for me, a little elbow would be, I'm trying to get there. Ballerini would knew who was there and for me, it, if it was, he might have tried two, three, four times to move him, but I can't imagine Ballerini in that situation with Remco on his wheel would have been like, no, I'm not letting this sprinter through, no, I'm not letting this sprinter through. I think he'd have had a little elbow. If he had a little elbow, there's a front-on crash. You can see it was a big movement, big elbow. Was, Sorry, but I, do we know it was a big right, elbow? Well, it wasn't a tiny little elbow. It was enough yeah, of a might, shove it, to get him out the road, but... It might have been fairly small, just because it looked like Ballerini was to the left of yeah. his teammate in front of him, and so if it was a small elbow and he had to break, by the time he did get there, he'd be so overbalanced mm -hmm. that it looked like a yeah, much bigger Ballerini. movement and a much bigger push. But I think, you know, yeah. Ballerini's mentality is probably still in the sort of sprint lead out and even sprinting himself vein as opposed to looking after a general classification leader and if you're in a sprint train or if you're a sprinter you do, you just don't give way mm. you're but that's, gonna, you're I think that's fight right though. I think that's right for Ballerini and that's why he's there to not with Remco, Remco on his wheel though but that's that, that's why he's there to look after him in these mm. finishes a lead out man is the best person Remco can possibly have in front yeah. of him in a finish like that he knows how to guide he knows how to move around there's no way Remco in that situation or Sudal quick step are going to get an easy run through they but need safety to safety first safety first with a GC guy on your wheel always. Don't start to crowd in on a sprinter who's on his train trying to win the stage. But why not? Try and stay out <laughs> of their way because you've got your GC rider and it's not worth it because he's, it's not like he's going to lose a, a chunk of time. He was already at the front. So Ballerini needed to stay a bit further away from Alpacin and, and stay out of Grove's way who's going to do anything and everything to follow his lead out I, th I think with this is that... Sudal Quickstep have just as much a right as the sprinters do to have there, just as the sprinters do when you're coming into a climb. They have would the same right. Would you have thought that when you were a sprinter, though? If you were in Katie Gross' position or you were leading out a sprint train, would you have thought, fair game, the GC <laughs> teams are here as well, they can come into the space of the sprint train? Would you have thought that? I'll, I'll tell you what a sprinter will think. Get out of the way or I'll get you out of the way. And that um, is all you think. It's, it's a split-second decision. You must go through. You don't want to waste energy. You certainly don't want to break or get blocked. So you just move them. It is... There's almost no thought process to it. You just do it. Well, come, I mean, we've spent the last five minutes talking about mm -hmm. it. That happened in half a second yeah. or less. At 60 kilometres exactly. per hour. So it's very right. easy to look back and slow it down and zoom mm -hmm. in and analyse it all. It, but, like you said, you, you might make a wrong decision. For me, you might still it's always, feel it's right, but it's such me, a short decision. It's always been the same. Since we started racing, it's always been the same. GC teams are always there. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. Something you have to deal with. There's always going to be these fights, and you have to accept it. The moment you start complaining and going, GC teams are here, GC teams are there, it's nothing new. Yeah. They've been here since time begun. It's just getting more chaotic. But as we saw yesterday, how many teams are benefiting off Sudal Quickstep being there? Yeah. A lot of yeah. them, because they're a good train to follow. But, you know, had the crash not happened all the way on the other side of the peloton, we would not even be speaking about that little elbow against the hip of Ballerini. Had Martin Tusfeld at that moment not been looking back and he just avoided it, oh, mm. made it, we would have said, oh, well, that was close, but and we wouldn't even have been we wouldn't have even back thought on. of it. Well, Martin Tushfeld has apologised for his role in the incident this morning.